We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. On today's program, I'm going to be asking a very personal question. It goes right to the heart of matters, but is something that is very seldom talked about. What is in your shadow? What do I mean by shadow? The unacknowledged, disowned and denied parts of ourselves that nevertheless play a huge role in how we live our lives and in particular how we interact with other people. My guest today is retired psychotherapist Connie Zweig, who was a witness for a previous edition of the show. Connie is an expert on the shadow, and she's the co-author of a couple of books on the subject, Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow. But we're going to be talking about her new book, which is called Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Lightness in Our Search for Awakening. So, Connie, let's start with basics. What do you mean by the shadow? Okay, I just do want to add the other book, which is called The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, which is about meeting the shadows of age in midlife and beyond. So my career has really been about exploring the unconscious process in all the different arenas of life, in our relationships, in our communication, in addiction, in depression in our aging process, and now in our spirituality. So what do I mean by that? Carl Jung coined the term shadow to refer to the personal unconscious, the part of us that's outside of awareness because it's forbidden, unacceptable, denied, taboo to the ego in relation to the ego or the conscious personality that we show in society. And so all of us have this kind of invisible twin or long bag that we carry behind us where we stuff away those things that feel dangerous or dark or taboo. And what happens is that some shadow content from that bag that we carry behind us may pop out at any time. It may erupt into our conversation, our behavior. So it may erupt as a critical comment. It may erupt as a compulsive behavior or addiction. It may erupt in a mood that we feel that we can't control, that kind of possesses us. It may erupt in a repeating fight in a relationship where we always have the same fight over and over again. And in the new context, in the religious and spiritual world, It may erupt in a charismatic leader acting out in a way that doesn't fit their persona or their statements about morality. Perhaps they abuse power or money or sex. And so we are meeting the shadow of a charismatic teacher. And then we may meet the shadow in ourselves if we then deny it, keep it secret, keep it in a blind spot by compartmentalizing it. And so the whole kind of dynamic of the student-teacher or disciple-leader relationship is all full of shadow and shadow projection. So what was it in your upbringing that prepared you to be an expert on the shadow? (laughs) My upbringing. Well, okay, I'll put it another way. Why was the shadow something was so compelling to you that you've chased it over all these different fields? Well, you know, I started meditation at age 19, and I really went for the light side. And I really believed if I meditated enough, it would all be light and flowers and positivity. And then when the teacher began showing his shadow 
and the community began to become coercive, I became disillusioned. And I wanted to understand more psychology, what was happening here. Eventually, in my 40s, well, in my 30s, I found Jung, and I began reading widely in Carl Jung's work and going into Jungian analysis to explore my own shadow. And then in my 40s, I went to graduate school and became a depth psychologist so that I could have a clinical practice and work with people on their own shadow issues. And then after 30 years of that, I retired from clinical work, but continued to write. So I was writing these books all during those years. And it just kind of naturally led me to write the book on aging after retirement and then the book on spirituality so that that made kind of a full circle back to the beginning of my life in meditation and meeting spiritual shadow. But most people become therapists and find an area of speciality for a reason. So what I would feel would be that growing up, there were a lot of things that were not allowed to be acknowledged in your household. I would say that my childhood was much like everybody else's. It wasn't about my childhood. It was about my life in terms of trying to understand the light side and the dark side of every human being, and beginning to see that everyone I met had hidden, unacknowledged dreams, desires, impulses, wishes. Some of them were very destructive in some of my clients. Some of them were self-destructive behaviors. Some of them were harmful to others. So it just became a very compelling area to me that was not being explored in the popular literature, except in some cases by people trained in Jungian psychology. Okay, so let's look at this idea in a little bit of depth, because whenever I talk to my clients about the unconscious, the response they get is, if it's not conscious, what can I do about it? That's right. It feels like it's outside of our line of vision in a blind spot, like when we're driving and we can't see that spot, but there might be danger there in that blind spot. So in the book, Romancing the Shadow, a colleague and I developed a method to begin to identify when a shadow part, which we call a shadow character, begins to emerge. And what we discovered was that every time a particular aspect of the unconscious starts to emerge, we say the same thing to ourselves, the same feeling arises, and the same physical sensations come up in the body. So let's say it's the addict. We're going to have the same internal dialogue, the same feelings, and the same sensations. And when we begin to identify that pattern then we can give it a name, let's say the addict. We can give it an image. I had a woman who was working with the foodie, she called it, and her image was a big open mouth. Mm. And so then she has all of these cues, inner dialogue, feeling, sensation, image, and she can recognize then that the foodie or the food addict is coming forward, is beginning to control her behavior. And there's an instant when you recognize that, that it's not out of your control, that you actually have a choice. It's a very quick moment. Okay, here's the foodie. Am I going to eat that ice cream again or not? I know the consequences of it. So I'm going to take a breath here and I'm going to make a conscious choice. Ice cream or no, no ice cream, cookies or no cookies. And in that moment, you are romancing the shadow. You are making a conscious relationship with that part of you that was previously unconscious. And what I'm sort of think I'm hearing is that you are taking this one relationship at a time with it. So you're not deciding never to eat ice cream again. It's just on this occasion, you're not going to listen to Addict or Mrs. Hyde or Mr. Anxiety or whoever else is popping up. That's exactly right. and. There's another level, which is that there's a valid hidden need in every shadow character. 
So when we trace them back into our history and when we see when they were formed in early childhood or in adolescence, there was a need in that moment to banish that dream or desire or aptitude into the shadow. What is the valid hidden need in the foodie? So as I explored this with my client, what we found was she needed to communicate to her boyfriend. And she was using food to stuff the words and the feelings, as her mother had done. She had learned that from observing her mother. So there are valid needs inside of these disowned parts of ourselves, every one of them. You know, the abandoned child, which is so universal, might act out in particular ways in someone, but it actually has a valid need, whether it's to be seen or to be nurtured or to be told that she won't be abandoned and she's valuable. So there are these valid needs. And when we can begin to meet those needs as adults for ourselves, we don't get so caught in those childhood disowned parts anymore. And I think it's interesting what you're saying. We can look after these characters ourselves rather than trying to get our partner or somebody else to look after them for us. Yeah, well, there are both options. You know, some people have a conscious enough and a nurturing enough relationship that they can say, you know, my abandoned child is up. Can you hold me for a while? And other people need to do that self nurturing on their own. Maybe they're single. Maybe the partner's not available or capable. Then they can do that on their own. They can give the nurturing to that abandoned child that she didn't get as a baby. So let's look at the subject of valid needs. I'd like to give you a quote from Jung, which I think actually I've stolen from your book, to be perfectly honest. And it is, could the longing for a God be a passion welling up from our darkest instinctual nature, a passion unswayed by any outside influences, deeper and stronger perhaps than the love for a human person? So, Help me unpick that and why you chose that quote. Let's, we haven't set up the context for that. So let's step back for a minute. So, in our spiritual lives, many people are drawn to charismatic leaders and teachers for some psychological reasons. For some people, they unconsciously attribute to that leader the perfect parent, the mother or father who is wise and compassionate, will never mistreat them, will never abandon them. And they imagine that they can kind of relive their childhood in a more ideal way. And so that idealized parent is a projection that that teacher then carries. So the student unconsciously attributes to the teacher, the ideal parent, And then the teacher carries that projection. So what Jung was saying in the quote is that there's something deeper than that. That is sort of the model out of psychodynamic psychology that most relationships are about parental projection. But Jung, in studying myths and dreams and some of his clients, found that there's something actually deeper than that which he called an archetypal projection. And so when we project an archetype or a divine image, a god or an idealized human being who we imagine to be divine, a divine projection, it's different from a parental projection, right? So then the valid need there is to connect with something greater than ourselves, something beyond ego that's transpersonal, that's universal. And so we imagine that that divine human can carry that connection for us and be the intermediary, either be the intermediary to God or to the divine, or actually be it him or herself. So many kind of clergy disciple or believer, leader, relationships are built on this archetypal projection. They may have hidden within it the parental projection, but they actually have this valid longing 
for the divine. I call it holy longing. Mm. And I write about that in the book. So many people who are seekers have that longing for the transcendent or what today we call non-duality. And then they ask this person who's all too human to carry that for them. And if you think about it, this is quite a burden for a human being to carry. There are teachers who carry hundreds, thousands in India. They carry millions of projections for their students. And they're not perfect. Even if they're in advanced levels of consciousness, they may still have unresolved wounds, unhealed injuries, shadow material themselves, because most people do. And our spiritual practices don't resolve those shadow issues. That's an illusion to think that they do. So they they may then act out, right? And chapter five of the book has dozens of stories of contemporary teachers who have allegedly acted out in very destructive ways, very harmful ways, even though they may be spiritually advanced. And this spiritual longing, can it go onto concrete objects as well? You know, it can. We can project onto money that, you know, it's the grail. And we see that happening in our materialist society where people hold money like an idol, like a god. And then we see it in spiritual communities. As soon as the money starts coming in, the teacher buys a Rolls Royce, right? Or a golden throne. And so this is the projection of the divine onto something that's concrete and material. I've had people who have struggled with eating disorders who I would say project the divine onto food. There's this belief that the muffin is the answer. And if I internalize that muffin, you know, it will in some way complete me. And that's an unconscious process. Usually it's not thought through, but it's about an unconscious projection onto the muffin or the Rolls Royce. So the holy longing can go awry when we project it onto something that's not going to ultimately be fulfilling and that may risk being abusive or traumatic. Because I'm imagining at this moment, lots of people are saying, well, I just won't worry about this spiritual religious sort of kind of stuff, you know, so I don't need to worry about this. But at this point, I'd like to, and I'm sure you know this quote from David Foster Wallace from his speech to the graduate students at Kenyon College, there is no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type of thing, be it JC or Allah or Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some intangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. (laughs) What do you think? Well, I think there are dangers inherent in unconscious worship and idealization. You know, there are really dangerous, risky matters here. And at the same time, it's natural to do so. And for some people, it's inevitable to do so. You know, there is a quote I like from James Hillman, the archetypal psychologist, where he said, tell me what you yearn for, and I'll tell you who you are. Mm. So when we begin to recognize what we're longing for, what is the object of our longing? And how are we worshiping it or idealizing it or turning it into an idol? When we begin to wake up to that process within us, it's a revelation. And it's a very important developmental step. And we can begin to, just as when we recognize a shadow character, we can begin to have a more conscious relationship with the object of our worship or the object of our longing and more choice about it. Does this fit who I am? Is this what I want to continue to idolize? Do I need to move on now and find a different way to connect with spirit? You know, 
So we can begin to ask those questions when we break the spell of unconscious idealization. So we can tell what we worship by what we spend all our attention on. Well, I think that's one way of noticing. There are many ways of noticing it. We can also tell if it's a person when that person acts out the shadow and we feel shocked and betrayed and even traumatized, then we know that we had been idealizing that person and not acknowledging his or her humanity and shadow, right? So in terms of the spiritual arena, there are you know, millions of people going through this now, recognizing that they are in, let's say, a fundamentalist religion that may be sexist or racist. And there, in the U.S., there are many people leaving the traditional fundamentalist religions now and moving to more unaffiliated groups. There are people inside of more sort of alternative mystical communities that are experiencing or witnessing abusive behavior by their leaders or by other members and waking up in the same way to shadow awareness. So this is happening, and, and you know, it's happening in the political arena in every country, I would say. But in the U.S., it's very dramatic right now where people are really waking up to the corruption and the abuse of the system and, you know, the shadows in the politicians who used to be idealized. Doctors used to be idealized, not so much anymore. And so this, the culture kind of goes through this pulling people down from the pedestal in different ways. I think the UK has gone through this with the monarchy, you know, where there is a lot of projection and idealization, and then the next generation doesn't do that so much anymore. And then the next generation begins to become critical rather than idealizing. So there's a process that's developmental here and that's going on in all of humanity. So what if it's actually something that happened really when you were quite young, because a lot of people are disillusioned with religion when they sort of become teenagers or they begin to, as they would say, think for themselves, but yet it will leave them entirely disconnected. So I have a close friend who was recruited into the Opus Dei, which is a fundamental Catholic one. People who watch the Da Vinci Code will... Yes. Um, I mean, it's nothing like the Da Vinci Code, but it was very controlling. You know, you there were all sorts of things like uh, boys were not allowed to masturbate, and if they did, they had to confess in the morning before breakfast with everybody watching. And they, there was only one reason why you would confess before breakfast. It was that. And, you know, not surprisingly, doesn't want to have anything to do with woo-woo and all that nonsense sort of kind of thing. And I think that it leaves a problem as you get older and maybe some of this longing has to go somewhere. How do you sort of heal those things that actually happened a long time ago, not something, you know, you've actually said, oh, well, actually, my religion is sexist and I need to start thinking of something else. That's much more sort of conscious and is a front of mind. These things that happened often 30 years ago are still having a profound effect, but are not so conscious. Help us with this, please, Connie. Yeah, that's well said, Andrew. So we all have, as I said, early unmet childhood needs that we bring to this process of projection and idealization. It happens when we fall in love. Oh my God, here's a man who's going to love me and never mistreat me. And my whole childhood will be healed. You know, I won't be abused and abandoned and traumatized because he's going to be the perfect husband. So this is what happens when we fall in love. Even if we don't say those words to ourselves, that's the projection. Same thing happens in the religious and spiritual setting. So for example, you keep wanting to go back to early childhood. So some people bring a need to be seen. It's called a narcissistic wound. They bring a need to be seen to their clergy person or their spiritual teacher. And they have the experience that that person sees into them who they really are. 
And that then forms the bond and builds the trust. Or they may have a need to belong because they always felt alone. So then they have a community that seems like the perfect family. I had a a man from the Moonies tell me that. He had the perfect family. Mm. I had people from TM tell me that. They found the perfect family. So that early childhood need gets met in the group with the idealized father, for example. They may have a childhood need to feel special. And so when they're recruited or chosen by a group that says they're going to save the world from apocalypse or enlighten the world or whatever it is, they finally feel special. I found it. I have the answer. I'm a chosen one. So what happens then if those unmet childhood needs get met? In adolescence or in adulthood, what happens is people get frozen in place in those communities because the promise of meeting those needs is so powerful that even if they begin to witness abuse, even if they begin to witness the teacher getting so angry and verbally abusive, or like you said, using shame to control behavior or using physical punishment to control behavior, or collecting money from people at a greater and greater price. Because those early childhood needs are being met, those people can't move. They don't want to question. They don't want to doubt. In some lineages, like Tibetan Buddhism, you actually take a vow not to question or criticize your teacher. It's part of the lineage to do that. So I think that that level of early childhood needs being met, the promise of that is extremely powerful for people. And in some cases, those people become survivors of abuse themselves. They don't just witness it. They become the survivors. You know, I interviewed many, many people for meeting the shadow on the spiritual path. And there were women who talked about being raped by their teachers and tolerating it because they felt chosen and special. And they couldn't risk. They said, this is my whole meaning. This is what I gave my life to. You know, he's the only one who cares about me. I have nothing if I leave. I have no one and nothing. So that's kind of what happens. And that's partly why it's so difficult to help people out of these communities who want to get out. You know, some people are divided inside. A part of them wants to separate and individuate from the group, and a part of them wants to stay. And that's a repetition of separation from the family of origin. So you mentioned adolescence. So, you know, a lot of adolescents is about how do we separate and individuate to become ourselves. So the same thing is being repeated when people are trying to leave religious and spiritual communities. And if you haven't done it successfully the first time, right, if you haven't achieved that the first time, it's hard to do it the next time. It's hard to become a whistleblower. You know, we went through the Me Too movement, and we really learned how hard it is for women to stand up and say, I'm being harassed. I'm being abused here. And that now I'm trying to apply what we've learned about consent and about consequences from the Me Too movement into the spiritual world. So if you are frozen, as you said, how do you begin to unfreeze yourself? Well, the second half of the book is about what I call spiritual shadow work. How do we begin to recognize that we're in a projection? How do we begin to reclaim what got stuffed into our shadows and given away to the other person? How do we begin to work with that in order to explore our own authentic feelings? I know when when I've been in spiritual community, the range of my feeling has gotten narrowed. 
People don't want anger. They don't want sadness in spiritual communities. How do we begin to allow those feelings to come up? Independent thinking or critical thinking. How do we allow the doubt to arise? How do we allow ourselves to kind of feel the fear that comes with critical thinking and yet allow it to begin to arise? How do we begin to question the beliefs that we've internalized from someone else? Are these really my beliefs now? Do I still really hold them to be true? You know, what are the consequences of not speaking up for other people who I care about? Will they be abused? How do I find my own agency so that I can act on my own behalf and on behalf of these other people? And, you know, as I describe stories in the book, some people decide not to leave a church or a sangha, or a zendo, or a synagogue community. They decide not to. They decide to stay and work on it. Work on speaking up, changing the systems, the policies, and so forth. And other people decide to leave and, you know, begin to explore something else, begin to explore what it means to live without the community, without someone telling you how to think and how to feel. And it's very scary. You know, there are a lot of books and movies about this. I'm thinking about Unorthodox, when the woman left Orthodox Judaism. Yeah, great There are great books movie. about people leaving Mormonism. There are films. There's a film called Wild Wild Country. It was on Netflix. I don't know if it still is. About Rajneesh Osho and that community falling apart. It's a profound documentary. And there was a series on HBO called The Vow, which was about a cult called Nixium. And you can watch as people begin to wake up to what is happening with the teacher, to begin to find out in that case that the teacher was having sex with just about every woman in the whole community and nobody knew what was going on. And he was held to account. Keith Raniere is in prison. It's very rare that there are legal consequences for these teachers. Most of them, if they get caught by the law, leave the country. Like Bikram, the founder of Hot Yoga, you know, split for Mexico. He was a sexual predator. So from my point of view, our task is to acknowledge, okay, Bikram and Rajneesh and a lot of other people, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, they made profound contributions and transmitted wisdom and practices that really helped a lot of people. We don't want to write that off. At the same time, they acted out their shadows in horrific ways, really harmful, traumatic ways. And so our task is to hold both the darkness and the light on the path and to begin to do that so that we don't deny the light and say, this is all cult and it's all bad. And we don't deny the darkness and the human shadow and the risk to people. So, I mean, this is really profound stuff. We have to hold the darkness and the shadow. And one of the wonderful ways of doing that is when you look in in myths, because in myths, you do see the dark side of the gods. You know, Hades abducts Persephone, I mean, Saturn eats his own children. It's pretty um, profound stuff. Well, the Greek myths, you know, the gods all have big shadows, yes. And if we look at mythology in many other cultures, I like Kali in India, the goddess of death and destruction. She's also the goddess of rebirth. So they're all woven in to the god and goddess images in a way that Judeo-Christian culture does not. It splits. There's Jesus and there's Satan. And so there's a splitting of darkness and light that people grow up with in this culture. And I think, you know, Jung's statement that we need to hold the tension of opposites and then a third thing will emerge is a profound teaching in this context. We need to hold the opposites and a third thing will emerge. Wow. Yeah, he calls that third thing the transcendent function because it transcends the duality. 
And it seems like we need a loss of innocence. Yes, I think that's really true. And for that reason, I say that the meeting with the shadow is an initiation because it pierces our naivete. You know, if we're in a childlike, innocent state around anything, around falling in love, around politics, around spirituality, if we're in an innocent naivete, we're going to be heartbroken. We're going to feel traumatized. We're going to feel shocked and betrayed sometime, somewhere, by someone, right? And I think that's happening right now on a massive scale around the politics in the U.S. People are totally traumatized by the polarization and also by the lack of action on the climate crisis. So there are all these kind of interconnected crises going on. And so people have been asking me, why would I focus on spirituality when all this other stuff is happening? And I think it's because people go there with their hopes and dreams to seek answers, to wake up out of the dream of duality and live in higher levels of consciousness. The dream of duality, I'm, I'm not following that. Please help me. Well, that's how people think about it. So if you're in, a, in the spiritual paradigm of development, there are you know, higher stages of consciousness than conventional, ordinary waking state, which is a dualistic state of I, thou, subject, object. And I know many people who have woken up out of that. I know many people who are in higher states of the witness, of unity, of non-duality, People have different names for it. This is real. Spiritual awakening is real. And I don't want to discard that in the context of shadow work. But one of the things I was really wrestling with in the book is how can that be real and people also have shadows, right? So it requires us to redefine awakening or enlightenment with a more psychological and nuanced and complex understanding of it. So I I was just recently with someone who lives in a really vast, non-dual level of awakening who just lost his shit the other day. He was just telling me he was triggered and he got angry and he got verbally abusive. And it was exactly what I was trying to write about. I was so grateful to hear this from him because I was trying to understand how that's possible. And so walk me through how his enlightened day-to-day stuff is so I can understand quite how him losing his shit would have been like. What's that like on a day-to-day basis? Well, this is a person who really kind of attained the dream of meditation practitioners. And, you know, his consciousness is kind of untethered from his body-mind. He can travel the cosmos. He can go through the bardos guiding people who have died. He has all these kind of special abilities, and he has a sense of no longer being identified with his body or with his beliefs. Or his ego. That's not who he is. You know, my subtitle of The Inner Work of Age is Shifting from Role to Soul. So this person knows he's a soul. It's not a construct. He lives it. So therefore, how could he still have such a psychological wound that he can be triggered like that and lose control? So I've explored a lot of different possibilities to understand this in the book. One that I like a lot is from Ken Wilber, the integral philosopher. And Ken says that our development is not global. It's not like we wake up and we become Einstein or a violin prodigy. Rather, we wake up along the spiritual line of development. And that doesn't mean that the emotional line of development is completely healed or that the intellectual cognitive line of development is completely healed or, importantly, that the moral line of development is just as advanced. And so if you read the stories in chapter five, you can see people have high spiritual development and low moral development, right? 
they weren't educated to cultivate conscience and empathy and relatedness, especially in Eastern cultures that are monastic and so forth. That's not emphasized. So there's that explanation. And then there's the explanation of shadow. In Vedanta, there is the teaching of Lesha Vidya, which is the remains of ignorance. And the remains of ignorance keep us human and keep us alive in the body. So you can be in a very advanced level of consciousness, but still have shadow material lodged in a chakra in the subtle body. So if it's lodged in the sexual chakra, you may act out sexually. Or in the power chakra, you may abuse power unconsciously. So there are two sort of models that I've been working with to explain this kind of seeming paradox. But I think the important message to say is just because there is a dark side to spirituality, to religions, we don't throw it out. We hold the dark side and the light side and we wait for something else, the third force to arrive. And that sort of is, in a sense, what we're doing with the shadow in every field. Am I getting this correct? That is correct. Yeah. We hold the dark side and we hold the light side. We don't split them off. We hold them in our awareness. And something else shows up. It may be an insight or an inspiration. It may be a new pathway to follow. It may show up as a way to follow your holy longing without projecting it onto a person. It may show up as a synchronicity in your life, a new doorway opening. We really don't know how it's going to show up, but the point is that something else emerges. So in a moment, we're going to look at a letter which is sort of really speaking to the topic that we're doing. So that's coming up in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. There are many ways of participating in The Meaningful Life. If you go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, you'll find out how you can become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and help fund us. You can get our newsletter, which comes every two weeks, and I write articles on psychological things. I've got one on the psychological aspects of money, which seems rather appropriate for today. You could get that, or you can write it a letter, and here is what somebody has done. I've been a member of a religious community for over 25 years. I brought my wife into it, and this has been at the centre of our lives. Unfortunately, there's been a scandal about what I will call the leader, because I don't want to identify anyone. Anyway, he has a big and compelling personality. It's come out that he has been having inappropriate relations with several of the younger female members. Since everything came out, several other women have come forward to report advances, being grabbed and squeezed, unwelcome attempts at being kissed. It has been really shocking. I looked up to this man. I thought of him as a friend too, someone I aspired to be, and now I feel sick. It has left me questioning my judgment and why I didn't put two and two together. The evidence was hidden in plain sight. I feel sick to my bones. It is also making me question my faith and my whole ethical framework. Part of me wants to leave the community, others have. However, the biggest pain, my wife and I can't talk about it. She just says, it didn't happen to me, that's it, and she doesn't want to leave. She gets angry if I talk about anything to do with this topic. The whole situation is breaking my heart. I'm so sorry to hear what this person is going through. And this is happening to many, many, many people. And people respond differently. So I am not in the position of telling people what to do or how to manage this. What I am trying to do with the book and interviews like this is just offer guidance, possibilities, 
because in many cases, this process of recognizing an idealized teacher's shadow really takes time. It unfolds slowly. It's kind of rare that somebody says, oh my God, he's doing that. I'm out of here. It unfolds slowly. And I think this person made a really important point where he said, I'm doubting myself. Because part of what happens is when you put your faith and trust in someone else and they act out the shadow, you look at yourself and you you can hardly believe how wrong you were or how badly you misjudge that person. So it creates a self-doubt as well as that doubt in the other person. And that can be immobilizing because then you don't trust yourself to make the decision to leave. So in this case, there are several questions I would ask. One, is this leader married? Is this adultery? Two, does this leader say he's celibate? So is this hypocrisy? because that makes a difference to some people. Okay, three, are all these women over 18 or are they underage? Which also makes another, you know, legal complication. So begin to look at those things, see how they affect you emotionally. So for example, I was just meeting with a lot of people in the TM community who've spent their entire adult lives in the TM community and are now shocked, they're in their 70s, to hear the stories about Maharishi was having sex. It was an open secret. People knew Maharishi was having sex, even though he was telling his students to be celibate. But one woman just came out. She was 15 when Maharishi approached her, and she's now 70, and she's just talking about it for the first time. So people are experiencing you know, a range of reactions to the scandals that are coming out now and their own denial and their own distrust of themselves, of their own judgment, just like our letter writer said. So this is going on in all kinds of ways. I write in the book about people dealing with it differently. As I said, some people will do the spiritual shadow work. It will empower them to leave. Some people will want to stay and work in the community. So, for example, I tell the story of Kripalu. You know, it was a famous yoga center in Massachusetts, and the yogi was having sex just like this leader. And when people found out, the whole thing blew up. I think he was married. And it took many years. They brought in consultants. They brought in therapists. Eventually, he left. And they redesigned the community. So that's one option. Then I tell the story of the LA Zen Center, where the head Roshi was a very, very old man, was having sex with women. The whole thing blew up, and it was taken over by a female Roshi, and she redesigned everything. All of the systems, the way people related, the way they practiced Zazen, and so on. And it's a really thriving community again. So there's that systemic way of dealing with it. And then there's the individual way of doing personal shadow work and making a decision on your own. Can you stay and tolerate it? Can you stay and be a whistleblower? Can you leave and find a different way to live? You know, what is the right fit for you for your own healing? But what it seems to me is, and he says it at the very end of his letter, the biggest pain is the fact that it's created a a rift between the couple. How can he be helped with the rift with his wife? See if he can find a language to talk to his wife about her own denial. So if she's saying that it didn't happen to me, and she's not empathic to the other women who are being harassed or molested, then she's not in her heart. She's not connecting to them and their suffering. She's invested in the status quo for herself. And that's okay. Maybe that's developmentally where she needs to be. She can't tolerate the threat of losing the teacher and the community. And so she's, you know, retrenching. And, you know, there are many marriages that have not lasted through these kinds of things. And there are others that have become stronger and more intimate because they are bonded by going through this together. 
So, you know, I would say find a language to talk to her, ask her what she can hear, what she can't hear, what your I statements about what you're experiencing, why this matters to you, and just do it little by little by little until she kind of opens up to be able to hear you. Yeah, because I think you're right. It's about actually listening to suffering. If you can't listen to the suffering of other people, it probably means you can't listen to your own suffering. And I would be very curious about her own suffering. You know, I'm sure he's going to be very well aware of her biography and where some of that suffering might be. And perhaps that's the place to talk about, you know, is this bringing up old pain in some sense? And if so, what is the old pain? And maybe talk about the old pain rather than the current pain. It might seem safer. Yeah. If they're not psychologically oriented, I don't know that they can do that. But if they are, if they have their knowledge about you know their own life histories and how that is shaping them, then that is another good option. So I normally ask people at this point in the program, what makes their life meaningful? But I've already asked you that question. So I'm going to put it in a slightly different way, which is the way that James Hollis asks the question, what is trying to come into the world through you? So what do you think is trying to come into the world through you, Connie? Well, I have 74 years of life experience, Andrew. And when I did my life review during a training to become an elder, what I saw was that all of my different careers had the same mission, which was to transmit information about consciousness. And so in my books, in my workshops, in my clinical practice, in my journalism, in my book publishing career, it was all about transmitting information about consciousness. You know, I have an invitation for people I'd like to put out, which is that if our conversation interests you and you would like to read Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path and do shadow work in community with other people, you can shoot me an email, ConnieZweig at gmail.com, put spiritual shadow work in the subject line, and give me your time zone. And I will connect you with other people in your time zone to do free online leaderless book study groups and read the book together and do this inner work together and really support each other. So again, it's ConnieZweig at gmail.com, spiritual shadow work, and then include your time zone. I did this with the inner work of age also. And so there are now these groups all over the world that are forming community and deep friendships doing this inner work together. That sounds brilliant. We'll put the details of that in the show notes, and you'll be able to find that if you haven't managed to write it down. So this is where the program ends for most people. But if you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life, we're going to be talking about projection and how we see the shadow in others, because projection is uh, the topic that is important for shadow we haven't unpicked yet. If you'd like to hear that conversation, you can hear the bonus material by subscribing directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.